Welcome back, brothers and sisters, as we continue our journey through the book of John. And today we're in John chapter 3, verse 15, which I have titled, To Believe, Believing, and Believe. Let me read from the verse. That whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. This is the first time the phrase eternal life is mentioned in the Gospel of John. The reason for its appearance here is that eternal life is associated to the new life that is the result of the born of water and spirit written in verse 5. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And born from above in verse 3, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And in verse 7, Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. Furthermore, life was mentioned briefly near the beginning of this gospel as being on him, that is, in the word. And here too, eternal life is in him, that is, in the Son of Man. Observing the order of the words, there is a suggestion that the matter of believing in the Son of Man, the verb to believe, is never used with the preposition of in in the Gospel of John, but always with in, which literally means into, as in John chapter 1 verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And in, chapter, in verse 11, this is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. And in verse 23, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, Many believed in his name when he saw the signs that he was doing. Or with a noun in a dative case, which means to accept something as true as written in John chapter 2, verse 22. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said these things, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Jesus is not speaking explicitly of believing in Him, hence by simply of believing, and as a result having eternal life in Him. Eternal life is where the emphasis is. Ironically, this life is prom promised to everyone who believes, precisely in a context in which some have believed in His name and yet not been given eternal life because Jesus would not entrust himself to them, as in John chapter 2, verse 23 to 25. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name, when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people, and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself, knew what was in man. The promise of the verse is contingent of the Son of Man being lifted up, just as the new birth is necessary in verse 7 in order to enter the kingdom of God, now defined as eternal life. Here, if anywhere, is a turning point the chapter. Edward W. Clink III in his book John, Exegetical Commentary on the New Testament, writes, that Jesus concludes with a purpose summary of his work in person, denoted by that with the subjunct subjunctive may have. In light of verse 14, this statement carries with it all the weight of, the hum of humanity's plight and the exaltation of the crucified God. It can only be offered after the cross, and it can only be received by those who believe in him. The nature of this life is eternal life. 
The addition of the qualifier eternal occurs here for the first time in the gospel and is only ever used to qualify life. Since the prologue already defines life employing the word, its qualification here is necessarily related. The phrase eternal life speaks not merely about the quantity of life, but also the quality of life. Eternal life is life in Christ. This concludes the final statement by Jesus. Although the majority of the translations imply that Jesus is seeking to end in verse 21, the expression and tone change, and the apparent change to past tense strongly suggests that the narrator takes over in verse 16. One reason verse 13 to 15 are often considered not to be Jesus' words is that they seem disconnected from what has come before. Therefore, when understood at the end of the social challenge dialogue, these final words belonging to Jesus by right of his victory are remarkable. At the moment when Jesus could be heralding the honor due to him, he announces his impending shame. Hence, it is Jesus' shame that Nicodemus can become victorious, albeit in a manner quite different than expected. While the proof of Jesus' victory will only be in, in the resurrection, as mentioned in John chapter 2, verse 18 to 19. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The power of his victory must go through the cross. Strange irony which Jesus ends his dialogue with Nicodemus needs to be explained by the narrator regarding its meaning and its significance in the following verses. As Christians today, we are known aware to the reality of Christ on the cross. As Nicodemus was not aware of the significance of being born again, we today do not have that choice in arguing any different. Christ has died for us. He has bled for our sins. And to believe in Him is just not a matter of a subjective choice. It has to start from within us. Having believing and having to believe and truly and truly to believe are significantly different attitudes of individual's character. To have eternal life is to believe. To have eternal life is to believe from your heart. To have eternal life is to look to the cross and believe that Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man, has died for us. Thank you and God bless.